Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I'm particularly pleased to, to be here at the RSA this morning. Uh, to launch this new report looking at the manufacturing sector. Delighted, too, that Vince Cable's able to join us. So, look, this is a, an independent piece of research led by the RSA in partnership with the Institute of Manufacturing at Cambridge. We very much agree with government that manufacturing is crucially important to the, to the growth of the British economy. So, manufacturing is a, a diverse sector with very specific requirements. Manufacturers need access to finance whether that's to invest in new production methods, new technologies, plant and machinery to make acquisitions. And indeed, of course, in the global marketplace, they need trade finance and access to, to capital markets and much more. And at Lloyd's, we under, underlined our support to the manufacturing industry by making a £1 billion lending pledge last year under the banner of the government's funding for lending scheme. And I'm pleased to tell you today that we're well ahead in, in terms of meeting that target, having lent £700 million in the last six months. And for me, supporting the manufacturing sector is very, about, very much about ensuring that my relationship managers up and down the country have the right skills and expertise in place to act as trusted advisors. So our teams undergo extensive training uh, in conjunction with the University of Warwick, accredited by the Warwick Manufacturing Group, and it was a program developed with the, the Engineers Employers Federation and the Manufacturing Technologies Association. And we've trained over 100 relationship managers so far, and we have more underway so that these RMs have an even better understanding in terms of their manufacturing customers. So we've been supporting manufacturers since 1765, and it's my pledge that we will continue that legacy today. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and Finbar, over to you. The financial crisis made us change our conversation about manufacturing. It made us think about manufacturing anew, because up to that point, we weren't really having a strong manufacturing conversation. Since the financial crisis, though, we have had to survive. And there's been a lot of efforts to support manufacturers to survive. So this report is very much about looking beyond tomorrow and the next week and the next month. It is trying to ensure that the trajectory is correctly set so that we don't succeed tomorrow but fail in the next five and 10 years. We're used to change one trend at a time. What we're not as used to is a number of trends all coming together at the same time and affecting how we organize our businesses. So we are seeing changes in oil availability and price. We are seeing changes in emissions regulations. We are seeing changes in production technologies. There are a number of things all happening at the same time. Commodity prices have risen and are volatile. And so when you put all of these things together, you will live in a different world which will change very rapidly around you. There has been almost a fetish around small companies and through the economics literature and through a lot of policy, supporting very small companies has been very, very important. Going up the scale, we jump from the small to the very large, and we jump straight to multinationals. And because we operate at those two ends of the spectrum, we miss the middle. These are companies who are relatively large. They have money to invest. They have agility, and they're very, very close to their customers. And in this world where demand is fragmenting, we're getting highly differentiated patterns of demand. <coughs> when you're getting the need to move quickly on opportunities, midsize may be a better size to be. And one of the interesting things coming out of the work is how do we think about supporting small companies to become mid-sized companies? And how do we help multinationals, if they need to, to think of themselves as collections of mid-sized companies rather than just one large structure? What we have done is we have shown you a model which discusses how changes in imports and exports will change the balance of trade in the UK. The work leads you to the position that says trade will fall. We are used to an economics which says that trade is growth. Trade leads to growth. You need trade for growth. 
And what we are trying to say is trade will be reduced, growth will continue because we'll use a different mechanism. We will use ownership rather than trade to enter markets. Now, how much will that trade diminution affect exports and imports? It could, it could affect it in a number of ways. And when you look at that and you say exports fall a little and imports fall a little more, 20 and 30%, you end up with a trade balance that shifts by about 20 billion. And if you translate that into employment directly, that's about 300,000 workers, but that's not going to be the number. One of the trends is that automation is rising. It has risen quite significantly in a number of industries, but it will continue to rise. And so the labor content of this production and labor content of new production is likely to be lower. We may get GDP growth. We may get a reduction of the trade balance. But we won't see as strong a response in employment. Okay? There is an unintended and an intended consequence then for environmental sustainability. If we are living in a world where production and supply chains become regionalized, if not localized, the transportation of goods around the world falls. The emissions due to that, obviously, is reduced. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation are doing very, very good work looking at how we link all of the inputs and outputs of single industries and across industries so that we are using less material and reusing as much of the waste material as possible. And bringing together these two pieces, we potentially have quite a strong impact on environmental sustainability overall. We make in different volumes. And so going from the bottom to the top, we can make incredibly craft items in volumes of one. Or we can make in the millions. Going from left to right, we can either make it right where you need it, or we can be in a global value chain where we make it in different parts of the world. We make the assemblies in different parts of the world. We ship pieces around. We do final assembly somewhere, and we may then ship that again and sell it somewhere else. And the feeling pre the financial crisis has always been that we're moving into, and we were already living in, the top right. We made everything in Asia in high volumes. The pressure is to move down to the bottom and to the left. The interesting pieces are making at volume very close to the consumer or making very, very low volume close to the consumer. And the top left is where the new production technologies tend to help you. 3D printing, or additive manufacturing to give it a, a better term, has been talked about and overhyped. But it is a very important, one of the very important technologies that is coming. Now, I'm not saying that it is only Additive manufacturing, there are other things here. The synthetic biology, there is new IT. There are different things happening in the fundamentals of the technologies that allow you to produce that will allow you potentially to do some of that top left box. To talk about the effect on the trade balance, here's the table from the report. Reduction in exports going from left to right and reduction in imports going from top to bottom. The numbers, if they're positive, are a reduction in the trade balance. And if they're negative, they're an expansion in the trade balance. An equal impact on exports and imports, given our current structure of trade, is positive for us. And any impact we can have to have a lower reduction in exports compared to the reduction in imports really gets us ahead. And the position in the report is that a lot of companies to access international markets will have to either own or control productive assets in those markets. You won't be able simply to ship and actually enter the market. And that's the change that's very difficult for some people to come to terms with. We're now trying to ask people to change their mode of understanding of organization of production and how they're going to move forward. The companies are working very hard. As long as they have a clear vision, they will continue to succeed, continue to increase exports, and hopefully invest in the new production technologies that allow them to move into these spaces. Government has made a number of moves in this direction. There has been a reduction of uncertainty in a lot of policy areas, but we're hoping for more clarity. We're hoping for better access to the new high-value manufacturing catapult, a focus on mid-size in the small business innovation research grants, et cetera, and essentially a TSB, Technology Strategy Board, that understands this space and wishes to work in this way as well. The finance required is for growth. 
companies have tended to sit on some cash balances, but the growth capital is what they need, so they need to have an understanding of how to invest. But it's only through action at the industrial level, at the governmental level, and at the surrounding organizations that we're actually going to succeed. Thank you. Whenever I talk to British manufacturers, they will make the point that you know, they're now either they've got a substantial price advantage or their, their, their profit margins on their exports have substantially improved, giving them an incentive to stay there and to invest. So that, it may be short term. We don't know what happens to exchange rates. We don't fix them and we can't predict them. But that is certainly helpful. But the more interesting questions are the kind of long-term structural issues which we've, we've just heard about. Uh, is it true that uh, there is some combination of technological and economic factors which is helping to repatriate um, manufacturing production to this country? And I hear many anecdotes about the kind of thing that we've just heard described in broad terms about the way in which technology is making it easier to produce bespoke products here, um, the way in which uh, labor cost advantages in Far Eastern countries are being eroded, uh, riding costs in China. You can't just keep pushing these things down the chain. You saw the horrible consequences in Bangladesh of simply pursuing labor costs at the exclusion of everything else. Um, and certainly in, in sophisticated uh, industries, that kind of thing doesn't work anywhere. Uh, and we, we are getting quite a lot of, you know, encouraging anecdotes that these trends are beginning to work. There is a very clear focus on supply chain development. Linking that with the ideas about medium-sized companies, this is a sector of the UK economy which has received inadequate attention, the so-called Mittelstand in Germany, um, the gazelles, as I think a recent CBI survey called them, and particularly, if I might say, in the, case, in the areas of finance, uh, because it's very difficult for these companies to get access to the stock exchange, they're too small, and we don't have a German-style financing system, Sparkas, and they don't exist. One very good innovation, though quite a modest one, is one prompted by the banks themselves, which was the creation of the Business Growth Fund, which is designed to provide equity capital for these uh, rapidly growing medium-sized companies um, who can't get access to the markets in, in other ways. Um, I'm in the process of establishing what we call the British Business Bank. Potentially, 5, 10, 20 years ahead, could be a massive uh, source of uh, financial support in the UK economy, but it, we're starting from a small beginnings, inevitably. And so one of the things we've established, and I think it's one of the best things we've done, actually, though it's quite low profile, is what we call the Advanced Manufacturing Supply Chain Initiative, where we've got um, something of the order of uh, 215 million initially. Um, things like the car industry, aerospace industry, um, other sectors, manufacturing sectors, funding, uh, not the primes, who of course can raise their own money, uh, but funding their, the supply chains that might otherwise drift overseas. So f finance is one area com combined with mentoring. Secondly, there's technology support. Uh, and reference has been given to the so-called catapults. I think this is uh, actually one of the best initiatives we've made under this government, but it's, it's, it's quite, so far it's quite a well-kept secret, and perhaps we ought to be doing more to promote it. But, but the first one was advanced manufacturing. It's a hub-and-spoke model. Headquarters is in uh, Sheffield, Rotherham. And it is loosely based on the German Fraunhofer idea, taking uh, technology innovation development closer to business. They are self-funding. I mean, the government comes up with the capital, but they are self-funding. We need to think about how we best do that. Thirdly, an absolutely key to these companies and manufacturing in general is skills. I mean, ev everywhere I go, um, we get this problem. You can go to areas of high unemployment, and the first thing that the companies will tell you is, well, we can't find any labor. And it's, there is a skill problem at, at craftsman level and at professional engineer level, which is absolutely acute in the UK. And it will become more acute the faster the recovery takes place. And we're trying to deal with that in a variety of ways. Apprenticeships are increasing quite rapidly, and particularly advanced um, engineering uh, apprenticeships. These university technical colleges, of which we've 
I think, launched 45. Um, five have already opened, are designed to target school kids, with, specifically with that objective. One of the biggest changes is the introduction of the employee, I'm sorry, employer ownership pilots. These are challenging, tra ch channeling training funding through employers, so they then buy the training they want rather than channeling through trainers who then you know, put people out into the market. It's quite an important shift of emphasis. Finally, alongside these kind of general generic um, horizontal policies, we are trying to develop um, a strategic approach to dealing with particular sectors. Uh, and in the autumn statement, we got um, the equivalent of two billion commitment. Important not simply because of the magnitude, but because it's, it's a long-term commitment, best part of a decade. And that represents, um, you know, the, the kind of tip of the iceberg of what we're doing in terms of an industrial strategy, trying to think long term, trying to work with business, trying to put in place long term commitments that will support the kind of initiatives which you've described. One of the interesting exercises going on at the moment, in which I think the RSA are involved, is the foresight study of manufacturing, thinking ahead to 2050 so that we're responding to the needs of manufacturing, not just on a year-to-year, month-to-month basis, but with that kind of very, very long-term um, strategic uh, perspective as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vince. There are big challenges in all manufacturing companies, and, and I must admit, when I read this report, I did wonder whether size was the right differentiator here, although I think it's an important one to fish out in terms of uh, scalability. For most mid-sized manufacturing companies, the, the challenges really now facing this environment are about going forwards, so the investment in new technology, uh, the skills, what I call total factor productivity, which is like, how do I use this new technology to gain uh, wealth and access markets? And how do I scan the boundaries to see what's coming at me? Now, that's quite a difficult thing to pull off in a mid-sized company where you've still got the day-to-day -day, uh, maximizing returns from your existing product range and taking it forward in the face of, of the, the conditions that we actually face. One of the things we've been teaching for about 10 years, and Finbar's been involved in this, is, is uh, next generation manufacturing. Beyond Toyota production system and batch size of one, the nirvana for manufacturers is to make at the point of consumption. And that's been part of the vision for manufacturing for a long time, but we're now seeing it actually starting to happen. One of the things we've done is to set up the UK's first fab lab in conjunction with MIT, which is a community-based facility for people from all walks of life to go in and make things using digital fabrication techniques. When we set up, there were 30 of these worldwide. We're two and a half years in. There are 150 of them now. There's six in the UK now and 65 more wanting to set up. And we're now seeing venture capital-backed models uh, that are similar to Fab Lab starting to enter the market globally. The opportunities there are around the other big dimension that affects this, which is where I slightly disagree on the size differentiator of this report, which is consumer innovation. The reason that I believe that the UK is on the cusp of a major opportunity is that I think we are a nation of tinkerers and inventors who um, reputedly can't scale up those inventions into wealth-generating multinational company models. Here is a model that allows us to invent and make and gain funding and gain access to markets through digital channels without all the traditional structures. And a recent piece of research which Nesta um, reported on with MIT looked at the incidence of consumer innovation globally and found that the UK has the highest percentage of consumer innovation internationally, 6.1% of people that just make things for their own use. And that's also why, slightly, take umbrance with the mid-size, they're not the only people that can capitalise here. Very, very small companies can come into this and make a huge difference very quickly. One small example of that 
a gentleman, 23-year-old, wandered into our Manchester lab a few months back wanting to make a memory stick for his iPad that sat flush with the side of the device, which apparently the existing ones didn't. So we helped him make that. He put it on Kickstarter. He got £500,000 worth of funding when he was after 15000 mostly in advance orders, and it's now on sale in the Apple stores. It cost him £1,000 to get that to market and it took less than six months. The calamity is that the products made in China couldn't make the actual scale up in the UK. So the last piece of that jigsaw is to connect UK manufacturers in to that groundswell movement of consumer innovation. And that, I think, is a winning combination for the UK. It's actually more difficult for larger scale manufacturing companies to engage with some of that consumer innovation. It's easier for smaller companies. For the mid-sized manufacturers, the challenges are all about facing that change and complexity and getting into those areas. So for example, last week I was speaking to a mid-sized company that's just spent the last two years being integrated into an American multinational. Their current supply chain includes a number of tooling manufacturers. Those tooling manufacturers could be completely put out of work by this digital revolution. We need to get them into digital manufacturing fairly quickly. Where's the investment going to come from to do that? Who's going to invest in that risk for those when the market's still fairly new and companies are only just beginning to be set up in it? So it's high risk. The bank's going to support that. That's the sort of area where I really do think government should be looking so mid-sized companies face those perennial issues, the capability to change, succession planning, finding the right senior skills to take the businesses forward, technical skills, a huge area, as well as an opportunity because, yes, we work with some mid-sized manufacturers that do automation. They see their business rocketing 30% growth a year international, and they see down the line that business coming back to the UK because we'll be automating mid to high skilled jobs in this country. And another flanking issue in this scenario is commoditization of capital equipment. We have a 26,000 pound 3D printer in our fab lab. We now have school children making 3D printers. The aim is to get machines that make machines. So everybody can have one in the bedroom. Everybody can download a pattern from the internet and make what they want at the point of consumption. That's a hugely different business model to the one we see today. These changes are all happening very rapidly and at the same time. So huge opportunities, but I do think the UK is particularly positioned well to exploit them if we can just get our heads around it. From an economic model, I'd look at Barcelona, for example, where a whole model of economic regeneration is now being modelled around digital manufacturing. In the US, the Foster Bill is being put forward to put digital fabrication into the community for one fab lab for every 700,000 of the population to support and advance a new generation of advanced manufacturing skills across America. What are we doing? A lot of it is about joining things up and being a little bit more visionary um, about what the UK could achieve and playing to our core capabilities and strengths because, yes, we're not German, but we could make a lot more of what we do actually have. Thank you very much, Jim.